welcome to today's episode of Daily Musings. I'm Alicia, and today is somewhat of a special episode. I'm only calling it special because this one's more planned, more researched, and not so much off the cuff like I tend to do. So a lot of times I sit here and philosophize. I think about things and share the thoughts that I'm having with you guys. Now, now I'm thinking about the Canadian election because today is September 20th and there was a federal election. It's a country, so federal election, it's a countrywide thing, it's a really big deal. And I wanted to take this opportunity to learn a little bit more about how elections work in Canada. I wanted to learn a little bit more about the parties and the people who represent those parties and have a more informed decision and just learn a little bit more about how the whole process works. So it's been a lot of fun researching this and putting this together. So I wanted to share this with you. If you have any interest in how um, the Canadian electoral system works, it's fairly similar to the United States system with a few key differences. So in this video, we're gonna go through a few things and I'm gonna try not to, I am going to insert my opinion in places. So don't take this as like totally unbiased because of course it's not. And don't take this as, uh, as gospel or not that I think you would, but I'm not uh, someone who researches this for a living, for example. So my perspective is going to be smaller than a lot of people who know more than I do. Um, very, very important things to keep in mind. But that being said, I will share a couple opinions, but I'm going to try in this video not to lean too heavily in any direction. So if I was really strongly for the, I'm just going to random example <laughs> Because I'm not. But if I was really strongly for the Green Party, this isn't just going to be a video where I'm like, Green Party, rah, rah, like cheering them on the whole time. I want to try to give a more balanced palette of, um, of everyone because I think it's not quite so black and white. As I'm considering the five different leaders of the main parties in Canada, um, I think they all have their strengths and weaknesses. There's not a single candidate in this session that I really hate, that I have like a visceral, passionate reaction against. I see most of them as um, good and flawed for various reasons. So we'll talk about that. I mean, the main things we're going to cover today, I want to talk about how the Canadian election system works. I want to talk about the individual parties and the leaders. I want to talk about where Parliament currently sits right now, how the seats are distributed between the parties, how the provinces typically vote, um, and just some ideas on what this election today might entail and why this election was called in the first place, just two years after our previous federal election, because like the US, we have a four year term system. And I also want to make some predictions for today's election as well. And um, I think I'm going to be vlogging this process so that tomorrow I'll uh, share that as well. So the election day vlog. Anyway, let's get into it. All right. First, let's start by talking about how the Canadian elections work. There are 338 seats in Parliament, each representing a different constituency. And we need 170 of those seats given to any one leader in order to form a majority government. So right now we have a minority government, which means that the Liberal Party, led by Justin Trudeau, has less than 170 seats. They're still the rulers of Canada, but they don't have enough clout to make major decisions. So we'll talk more about that in a little bit when we talk about why this election was called in the first place. There are three types of elections that you can have in Canada. You can have federal, which is what we're doing right now. The whole country votes. You can have provincial, which is obviously um, each of the 13 provinces and territories can hold um, elections for who, who the premiers of the provinces are. And municipal, when we're doing citywide elections. Each of the 338 members of parliament hold a four-year term, which can be um, extended and each one of the 338 members represents an electoral district. So what we do in Canada is we use the plurality system, which is similar to the US. So whoever is the prime minister isn't prime minister from popular vote. If that was the case, the conservatives would be the government because the conservatives narrowly had the popular vote in the 2019 election. What it means is that every region of Canada is uh, Canada is divided into basically 338 regions and each region votes for their own MP. So in my, let's say Regina, um, the city that I live in had 70% of the people voted conservative. We still out of the 14 seats that we have in Canada, we might actually end up with like, um, you know, 12 of those 14 being filled by conservatives, even though they had less votes. It's because in each individual riding, it's, it, it's which MP wins the race in each 
um, each section, essentially. So that's one complaint that you can have about that is the person who's in power isn't necessarily the person that the most people wanted in power at a federal level because we're really focused on voting each um, like regional member of parliament. So basically, the leader of the party most likely to hold the confidence of the House of Commons becomes, becomes the prime minister. So one difference with the United States and Canadian politics is that there are um, several parties that make up parliament. And we'll talk about what those parties are. Now, in the US, you basically have two parties. You have the Democrats and the Republicans, and then you have um, independents. Um, but it's really two dominant parties, which is true in Canada. We also have two dominant parties. We have the conservatives and we have the liberals. Um, but there are other parties that have some amount of clout and have a certain amount of seats in, in, um, in parliament so that um, it's basically not just like a duel between two sides. Um, <laughs> one fun fact is that Democrats and liberals, very similar ideologically. And then you have conservatives and Republicans, very similar. Um, but their colors are reversed. So in Canada, liberal is red, whereas in the States, Republican is red. So it's totally backwards. And in Canada, the conservatives are blue. We call the runner up to the main party the official opposition. And it's pretty much always the top two parties are pretty much always the liberals and the conservatives. And they just kind of flip sides. However, there was a time in um, 2011 where the NDP, the New Democratic Party, which we'll talk about, became the official opposition. They were the second most popular um, platform in Canada. And the NDP has since slipped drastically since that. But that was, I believe, the only time in Canadian election history when another party became second place instead of uh, like not. And at that point, we had a conservative government with NDP second and the liberals really fell from grace for that election. They became the um, basically the third place. They weren't even the official opposition anymore. Another fun fact about Canadian elections, very different from American ones, is we are not allowed under the Election Act to run long and expensive campaigns. There's a limit to how long the, um, there's a both a time limit and a spending limit for how, um, how grandiose an election campaign can be. So the range of days that we can actually basically um, campaign for, for different people is 36 to 50 days. That's it. Now, in the States, obviously, they're basically campaigning for the next election for two years. Uh, but in Canada, you really can't um, start, getting up, start getting out there and promoting your own party until that 36 to 50 day window. Or sorry, yeah, I think it's about 50. I think there was one that went 55 days. Um, so this particular election was um, given 37 days between when it was called, which was on August 15th, to when everyone votes, which is September 20th. And thank goodness for that, because that means we're not inundated all year long with um, election news. That would, uh, that would drive me nuts, as it probably drives many people in the United States nuts as well. And a final difference between Canadian government and American government is that we don't have a term limit for our prime ministers. So in the United States, a president can only serve for two terms, at up to ter two terms, um, four-year terms in Canada. You could go as long as you're still getting voted in. Um, so I think the in recent memory, the prime minister who was in parliament for the longest amount of time was Pierre Trudeau. Justin Trudeau is our current prime minister's father, who was in power for, I believe, around 16 years. All right, so let's talk about the different parties. Of course, we have the current government run by the Liberals, led by Justin Trudeau, and they are basically center to center left, very similar to the Democratic Party in the United States. The Conservatives are the basically currently the only right-leaning party. Um, so the other three parties are all pretty left-leaning. The only difference would be there is the marginal and highly vocal PPC um, members of the People's Party of Canada, and they represent the very far right. Um, fortunately, they don't have a place in Parliament yet, and hopefully they won't have one anytime soon. So it's the Conservative Party by, uh, led by O'Toole, Eric, Aaron O'Toole. Then we have the um, the other two current official parties is we have the Bloc Quebecois led by um, Blanchette, and they are, um, they're left-leaning as well. They're, they're more like center left, so they're pretty similar to the liberals that way. Um, and they represent Quebec nationalism. So they are, um, their function is essentially to represent the French people of Canada. So they're very Quebec specific. And then we have the NDP party, the New Democratic Party, who uh, are led by uh, Jagmeet Singh. And they are the most 
left-leaning party. Um, you could consider the green-leading party to be pretty uh, left as well. So they represent um, basically social democracy. So you can think of Bernie Sanders, who actually has endorsed the NDP specifically. And um, yeah, just a quick thing on, I just want to talk about with the bloc. So in my lifetime, Quebec separatism has been represented by the bloc. So basically, I remember, I think it was in the 90s, I was a kid when this all happened, but Quebec almost um, ejected themselves from Canada entirely and became their own country. And this didn't come to pass, but there are um, quite a few people in Quebec still who are um, separatists. Now, most bloc Quebecois leaders are in favor of this, but um, Blanchette is a little bit different because this isn't his aim. It's not his goal to eject from Canada. His goal is to just be a voice for um, the French in, and for Quebec in Parliament. And then finally, the only other party with seats, and right now the number is two, but they don't have enough seats to be an official party, is the Green Party, led by Annemie Paul. And um, of course, they are also very left-leaning, being an environmental non-violence party. So let's get into a discussion on the leaders of these parties. So as of this moment, let's talk about how the seats are dispersed in Parliament. So of those 338 seats, right now the Liberals currently hold 155 seats, which is just 15 seats shy of what they need for a majority and what the Liberal Party is hoping to achieve in this election. The Conservatories hold 119 seats. The Bloc Quebecois holds 32, so they are the, um, the third most popular party. The fourth most popular party is the NDP who has um, 24 seats and the Green Party um, currently, I believe, has two seats. So those are how the 338 seats are distributed in Parliament. Um, one notable thing here is the Bloc Quebecois, um, as of the, I believe, the, um, the 2019 election, they only had 10 seats. And then in 2019, they, a whole bunch of liberal voters switched over to the Bloc. And we'll talk more about what the Bloc represents. Um, so they went from 10 um, to 32 seats in that 2019 election, which was a, a pretty, pretty big deal. The well-known liberal leader is Justin Trudeau. He's held power since 2015, although his majority government became a minority in 2019 due to disappointment, scandals, and etc. I'll talk about that a little bit more later. He is the likely winner of today's election. Otherwise, I mean, why else would he have um, called the election if he didn't think he could at least win it? Um, so he's not concerned so much with a loss, although it is technically possible that he could lose to the Conservatives this time around. But what he's really concerned about is sealing the deal of a majority. So again, we'll talk a little bit more about him later. Up next, we got the Conservative leader. Um, he's a new leader. He's only been the Conservative leader for the last year um, to replace Andrew Scheer. Um, for what it's worth, I like him. I, I really quite like Aaron O'Toole. I think he's a pretty cool dude. He seems like a pretty upstanding guy. Um, I have nothing against him personally. I think uh, the problems from uh, from him is the, the, his party. So um, I, I kind of have a little bit of a personal vendetta against the conservative governments back in the Harper days because um, in the decade that Harper was in power, the conservative government reduced a whole bunch of art funding, which is relevant to me as an artist, and basically killed the film industry, which was just starting to blossom in Saskatchewan. So that um, basically a whole peop bunch of people who were in the film industry here had to move. And I thought that was pretty, um, pretty brutal, not really too happy about that. Um, I do have other is issues as well. So my main issues with the Conservatives is that a lot of MPs don't um, quote unquote believe in quiet climate change. Um, and then uh, you know they, they voted to keep conversion therapy happening, um, all that, like just a lot of stuff that I am ideologically against. But O'Toole himself is a moderate, he's pro-choice, he's pro-environment and all of that. So my issue isn't with him, uh, it's it's his party. Because even if he has, uh, let's say he had impressive climate change legislation, I don't think it's particularly impressive, but he has climate change legislation. How is he going to pass things if his government is in power when some of his own party wouldn't even vote for the, the things that he suggests? So I think that's a big problem with the conservative government, but they are the major opposition in this case. Then we got the Bloc Quebecois led by Blanchette. He represents uh, Quebec. Uh, basically, no one votes for the Bloc in other regions. And his stance is basically, dude, not here to be prime minister. I'm here to be the voice for the French. Quebec, uh, so this is this is one thing about his platform uh, that really came up in the debates, but uh, Quebec, like France, has banned religious, visible religious symbols in the workplace. So this is something that 
actually has popular support in Quebec, but it's led many to call uh, people from Quebec or leaders in Quebec racist. So really contentious issue here. Um, basically, the idea is that France and Quebec are secular. So that's their whole thing. Um, and they hold that religion has ne never led to equality. Uh, but it's a major topic of conversation right there. Uh, we have the NDP, led by Jagmeet Singh, who is a charismatic, almost millennial. I mean, <laughs> just a weird fun fact, but I think he's only about four years younger than O'Toole, and they look like they're decades apart for, <laughs> to me anyways, I think that's just a like kind of fun fact. Anyway, Jagmeet says all the right things about climate action, reparations, and so on, but uh, the thing he's criticized for is for not taking a clear stance on things like the Keystone Pipeline. So when NDP uh, MPs are asked directly, like, pipeline should this be a thing yes or no uh, they avoid answering um and people wonder how jagmeet would fund the changes that he promises especially people who vote conservative because that's always a main concern it's like okay it's great to have these wonderful ideals but what's the practicality of it how are you going to get canada out of debt um so the thing about the Bloc and about the NDP and the Greens is they none of these people will ever be prime minister. I shouldn't say ever. This election, very, very, very extremely unlikely that any of them would achieve enough seats. Like the NDP currently has um, like a couple dozen seats. <laughs> There's no way they're going to get, um, you know, enough to form a minority government. But the more NDP and Bloc and Green seats there are, uh, it just adds more voices in Parliament, so it's not just two sides. So it is useful when they get more votes, I think. Um, anyway, so finally we have the Greens, led by Anime, Anime Paul. She's brand new, just like Erin O'Toole. And the party has been in a state of disruption. Just There's been internal conflict over the um, what's going on in Palestine and Israel. So um, I don't know like the deep details of the story but it's just uh yeah there's a lot of chaos um the party's kind of fighting itself so i don't expect anything fabulous to happen um, but for what it's worth i think anna marie at the debate really shone uh she's a clear speaker she had strong ideas um, was voting for unity um yeah so the greens i mean probably what you imagine they're all about sustainability non-violence social justice one thing that i find weird though as environmentalists is they're against nuclear uh, nuclear energy so it's hard for me to imagine how we can mitigate the climate crisis without the use of nuclear. So I think that's kind of a strange stance. I know there's reasons for it. Uh, I just don't agree with them personally. All right. So the main question that is on the minds of a lot of voters is why did Trudeau call an election? A lot of people are really, really unhappy in our country about this because the timing is just terrible. Um, we're in our fourth wave of the pandemic, which is really being propelled forward by Delta. There is the um, conflict in Afghanistan that's uh, just basically started happening around the same time that the election was called. So people are calling Trudeau out for having terrible timing with this and, um, and so on. So that's the main reason that he's calling it is because he wants a majority government. He wants to go from 155 seats to 170, like he had when he was first elected in um, 2015. So the, um, the reason that he wants a majority government is similar to why a majority government is useful in the United States as well, is because it's really difficult to pass legislation when you do not have a majority government, because you're going to get blocked by the other party. And if the other party is numerous enough, then um, it's very difficult to get anything passed. So for example, this summer, Trudeau talked about the toxicity and obstructionism in the House of Commons. So he was accusing the opposition of stalling government bills. Uh, one of them that uh, was a really big problem is that Canada had a bill to end conversion therapy. And for those of you who don't know what that is, conversion therapy is just um, when you basically uh, stick a gay person in uh, like, a, like a therapy program to try to make them not gay. So the liberals were saying, hey, this is a little archaic, let's get rid of this. Um, it's not a good idea. It's not helpful. Um, gay people don't need fixing. So um, it was blocked by the Conservative Party. And this legislation then wasn't able to be passed. So things like this happen a lot. And that's uh, really difficult for Trudeau, especially because we're in a situation where we need to take a lot of action now on climate change and things like this. So um, another, another point where the Conservatives blocked the Liberals is on um, key bills, including the spring federal budget that extended 
emergency support for COVID to um, to workers and businesses like wage sub subsidies and rent subsidies. So it eventually cleared in June um, during the pandemic. Uh, but the only reason it cleared, it wasn't because the Conservatives stopped blocking it. It's because they gained the support of other left-leaning um, groups like the Bloc Quebecois and the NDP, uh, who also believed in wage subsidies and helping out the average person throughout the pandemic. So basically the government needs to be able to take quick and decisive action if it wants to get anything done. But of course, opponents to this idea don't want the liberal government to have um, too much power to pass things that they might not agree with. Um, and again, the timing. So um, the, the problem that Trudeau is going to have in order to get a majority government is he doesn't have the love of the people. He doesn't have deep support in Canada. He has kind of um, what feels more like a begrudging support. And depending on what area of the country you live in, such as where I live, a deep contempt exists in this country for Trude uh, in this uh, particular highly conservative region for Trudeau. So it's very, um, I think it's going to be very difficult for him to get that majority. All right. So let's talk about how the different um, basically the different provinces vote and territories. So Canada is a huge like geographically, um, not population wise, it's actually pretty small population wise, but huge geographical region. Um, so the needs of people in the West are totally different from the needs of the people in the East. And uh, it's one of the one of the challenges of electing someone in Canada. But we have um, 13 provinces and territories, which are basically chunked. So I live in Saskatchewan and we're kind of lumped in with Manitoba, our neighboring um, prairie province. And then all the territories are lumped in together. They have pretty low populations. And then all of Atlantic Canada. So the four maritime provinces are all lumped into one, um, one chunk here. So traditionally, Atlantic Canada, Ontario and Quebec, uh, so the first three are all quite liberal. And um, Ontario and Quebec in particular have really high populations and a lot of seats in Parliament. So then we have Manitoba, Saskatchewan and Alberta are all strongly conservative overall. So if you're looking at a map of Canada, you got the West, who's conservative, except British Columbia, the West Coast, and then the East is liberal. So basically people in the West, so in my area, they get really grumpy about um, how things are distributed because we have way less population in Manitoba, Saskatchewan than the rest of the country. And as a result, we have less seats. So we tend to shake our fists at the big city dwellers who are seemingly anti-farm, anti-oil. It's like, that's how we make our money, right? So. Um, what I find interesting, so you'll see the supports in uh, for the Liberals in Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Alberta, so a prairie province is very, very low, um, very high conservative support. Um, what I find interesting is that typically Saskatchewan um, has uh, a high NDP support ship. So basically no one likes the Bloc Quebecois, except for Quebec, <laughs> which is fair, because they're meant to represent the French of the country. Um, and then, of course, uh, I'm a little disturbed to say that the, the PPC, um, really alt-right, uh, far-right party, a little bit uh, disturbing to me, you know, the rock-throwing party, um, they have the highest percentage of their members in Manitoba and Saskatchewan. Um, and, and you just know that more of that percentage is based in Saskatchewan. Um, yeah, so uh, yeah, Alberta really hates the Greens, which I think is uh, kind of obvious. Alberta has 53% um, conservative base and only a 1% support of the Greens. They're basically polar opposites. Um, but the territories and British Columbia are the ones who really give the Greens some support. But here's where popularity doesn't matter as much as the seats taken. We could have a whole bunch of um, crazy alt-right types, uh, but it doesn't matter because the PPC isn't going to overturn any of the seats. There's there's not going to be a PPC leader in Saskatchewan. There, there just isn't um, enough support in each individual region. It's plain and simple, and thank goodness for that. So Manitoba and Saskatchewan only have, um, oh, I think I'm on the... Uh, the wrong oh no this is the right one so we only have 28 seats in between these two provinces so 14 each out of 338 so two provinces um, we make up eight percent of the representation in parliament um but it's for the population reason so we have only 2.6 million people between these two provinces in a country of 38.1 million so it's approximately seven percent of the population eight percent of the representation the numbers make sense um, and I think that's absolutely fair that even if um, people here feel like we're not represented well in Parliament, it's well, we have way less people. So I think I think that um, does kind of make sense. 
I think in order to properly understand the concept, uh, the context of this election, we need to understand the uh, the history of the basically like the last 10, 20 years of Canadian politics. And I won't get really into this, but when Trudeau had a liberal majority, he won the election in 2015. It was a major victory because we were coming out of 10 years of Stephen Harper's leadership, who was the um, conservative leader. So people were basically just tired of the conservative governments at that point. So the liberals had a strong win. Um, and then he did a bunch of things right at the beginning of his um, prime ministership that improved his, um, like people just really liked him. So he welcomed in a whole bunch of Syrian refugees. Um, he marched in a pride parade. He, um, his party had a record number of um, Muslim MPs. He established a gender parity for his first cabinet, which meant he did 50-50 women and, and men in his, um, basically he said, it's 2015, I mean, we've got to do this. Um, he increased the quotas for immigration. He legalized cannabis. Like he did a lot of things um, very early on, but people, there was, there was controversy. So over the last eight years or so that um, Trudeau has been in power there, uh, or has it been, let me see if I can count. It's been six years. Try that again, because um, he was reelected in 2019. Um, so for example, uh, people were mad about his foreign policy. So he was, um, you know, basically siding with the Israelites, um, selling weapons to Saudi Arabia, um, which is not, those are just very conservative things to do. So uh, liberals who voted for him were feeling disheartened. And then what really sealed the deal um, with a lot of people who support Aboriginal rights and climate change, uh, people were really, really mad about the Keystone Pipeline deal. So this is a pipeline that they basically put $4.5 billion towards uh, building between Alberta and Nebraska. Huge oil pipeline, um, very unpopular with environmentalists and First Nations um, because of the communities that the, the pipeline would disrupt by running through it. Um, and it basically made liberals who were concerned about climate change question how serious Trudeau really was about climate change. So that was another knock on his, um, his, uh, his record. Two other things, though, big knocks on his record. One of them was his government's attempt to halt proceedings into a basically a Quebec based engineering firm. There was some shady business that happened and a couple people resigned because of the mess and uh, because of wanting to maintain integrity. I don't know like the really complex details. I know the overview, but that was a big deal. And people were starting to talk about, oh, the Liberal Party, Justin Trudeau is just another one of those politicians. He's just another one of those those crooks or those shady people who um, promise things and uh, then do other things that are less great. And finally, there was a blackface incident. So uh, it's worth mentioning this, even though other um, other people in parliament, so um, Blanchette and Anna-Marie Paul, they basically said, okay, I, Trudeau, I don't think he's a racist, um, but this is, his past actions were really disappointing. So 20 plus years ago, Trudeau um, went in blackface. He dressed up as Aladdin um, at a school. And uh, yeah, the pictures surfaced. He tried to suppress them and he said it was because he was really embarrassed. It was just a part of his past that he wanted to, um, to hide from. Now, he wasn't, uh, he was maybe being unconsciously racist at the time, but um, most people would say that his actions towards, um, uh, towards uh, equality and things like that, uh, he's not an active racist anymore, but it was a dark, troubling thing that came out of his um, past and he's definitely apologized for it. But yeah, that was a thing. So another thing that is worth mentioning, um, some people have different opinions on this. If American leaders endorse um, Canadian leaders, then it's like, hey, keep your hands out of our politics. But it is worth saying that in 2019, Obama did endorse Trudeau, um, saying that uh, yeah, he was probably the best person to do the job in Canada. But the thing is, is that voters in 2015 really wanted electoral reform. We wanted a lot of structural changes that Trudeau promised and then just didn't deliver. And it's worth bringing Obama into the conversation because he faced the same thing. He struggled against the shackles of the systemic inequality. Um, he was unable to change things that he wanted to change. And something very similar has um, happened with Trudeau. And perhaps it's a, a feature of democracy. But um, yeah, like people are also, people also just don't like Trudeau because he, he was born privileged. He was born to the prime minister, uh, really beloved prime minister of Canada. Um, he grew up with, uh, yeah, with, with privilege. He has an important name. He, you know, people say the silver spoon, everything like that. 
Um, and uh, worth mentioning again that in 2019, the Liberals went from a majority to a minority, and the Conservative Party won the popular vote. So that's an interesting place two years from then to pick up. Now, since then, um, Trudeau has done a pretty good job with the pandemic and how he's handled it. Um, he's demonstrated pretty strong leadership for that. So I think his party is hoping that uh, people will continue to support the Liberal Party because of all they've done for uh, during the pandemic and, and just to, um, from my point of view, I think it kind of makes sense not to switch leadership during a pandemic because uh, you, it's, it's just such an important issue that we get through this and that things don't get like convoluted or confusing or step backwards or anything like that and how we're handling it. So, um, yeah. So basically one more thing to mention about in 2019, when he lost the popular vote, it was because of a few things, the NDPs picked up more seats. Um, but most importantly, and I mentioned it, this at the beginning, but the Bloc Quebecois, basically, uh, 22 seats flipped from liberal, most of them, uh, from liberal to, um, uh, to, <laughs> sorry, to Bloc. And um, yeah, they lost their majority largely because of Quebec's decisions. So now this election, uh, September 20th, 2021, it's the 44th election and um, yeah, in Canada's entire history. So we have our main party, we have the official opposition, and then we have the alternate opposition parties, just to sum up. Um, last, so the order right now is it stands, we have Liberals, number one Conservatives, official opposition. The Bloc has the third most, and we have NDP and Greens. Um, and we'll see if that juggles around a little bit, if the NDP picks up more seats, if the Greens lose a seat, how the Bloc does, if they stay very Quebec focused or if they lean more liberal. And um, yeah, we'll see what goes with that. But basically the predictions for today's election are not gonna be my own. So there's a website called 338.com uh, that predicts how things are going to turn out. It has information about individual writings and stuff like that. So from their data, they're thinking that the Liberal Party, the current minority leader, will get 146 seats. So they're going to lose seats, but maintain uh, a minority government in Canada. They predict that the Conservative government is not going to overtake them this time. Um, they're predicting the Conservative will grow um, from, I believe it was, what was it, 112? Um, 119, to grow from 119 to 127. The Bloc will hold steady at 32. The NDP will make some gains at 31, and then the Greens will maintain two seats. Um, there's a 15 chance, 15% 15 chance that the Liberals will achieve a majority government, and a 68% chance that the Liberals are gonna win this election in general. So it's still gonna be a little bit of a nail biter, I think, um, even though I think the Liberals will probably maintain their majority. Um, you never know. So as recently as a couple of weeks ago, though, the Conservative government party, uh, sorry, the Conservative party was polling better than the Liberal Party and had a slightly stronger position than they're showing now. Um, and yeah, just to, to kind of go over a couple things we said. So each region is represented by an MP, a member of parliament. So even if I wanted to maintain a Liberal government, which I do, it doesn't matter if I vote Liberal, which is kind of a weird thing, because in my particular region, Right now, there's a toss up between the Conservative Party and the NDP Party. The Liberal Party just has no standing in my, basically my neighborhood, my neck of the woods. So if I want my vote to matter, then um, a, liberal, a, a liberal vote in my region would basically be a throwaway vote. And I'm not against that because sometimes that's the thing to do. But it matters more if I vote Conservative or NDP in this particular instance even though I would still prefer, and this is my opinion, a liberal government. Um, I support a lot of the things they stand for, and I'm well aware of the party's flaws, and they're not the party that I would um, maybe choose, even if um, it mattered in my particular region, but it doesn't. So it's, it's one of the weird little quirks of this um, plurality voting system, I suppose. But anyways, that's all. I'm sure this is a long video. I already can tell that we've been talking a good long while. So hopefully this gives you a little bit more context. Um, I know that going through all this data um, really helped me think through uh, the electoral system and how I'm gonna vote and uh, basically the state of things as I stand right now. I'm really excited to get out there and vote this afternoon and to watch the results on television at my parents' house. And again, I'll be vlogging this, so I'll uh, perhaps if, uh, if it's fun, I'll share it tomorrow and catch up with you then. Thank you so much for joining me.